Friends, welcome. This is our uh, pre-full moon um, webinar, and we're going to kind of uh, warm up for the exact uh, full moon, uh, which uh, takes place uh, early in the morning of the 11th. Let's see now, I, what is today? I think it's Thursday, Here, where I am anyway. So uh, GMT-wise, it takes place early uh, in the morning of Saturday uh, on the 11th, and uh, the time will be at 12.32 and 48 seconds a.m., and uh, two years beginning the broadcast uh, at 11 p.m. just, you know, on the 10th, just uh, an hour and a half earlier. So uh, I hope you can join us if you don't have uh, other full moon events uh, which you are either responsible for or responsible for attending. Well, you know, here we have the great sign of universality. Um, it's an amazing, an amazing synthetic sign. It is um, a sign in which uh, people customarily can take the second initiation, the third, the fourth, and even the fifth initiations. Maybe it's not so commonly found as Leo at the first uh, initiation. Uh, it is the sign in which uh, so many people uh, who are becoming masters of the wisdom, end their experience and become the full-fledged world server. Next, next month we'll talk about Pisces where maybe a few end their experience and become uh, affiliated with Shambhala through great sacrifice. There's uh, so much to say about it that I think maybe one just uh, has to try to hit the essentials on it. You know, if, if you want more on this, I've, uh, I've done that work on esoteric astrology book, um, you know, page by page, paragraph, sentence, word by word. So there'll be more there uh, for you to find. And I'm hoping, you know, that uh, when I finish this uh, compilation, well, what is it really? When I, when I finish working in the second part of the rays and the initiations doing the second part, there's still a few hundred pages to go, I'm going to take uh, many of the big compilations which say everything that DK has said about uh, uh, particular initiations or energy centers or hierarchy or Shambhala and just, you know, go down those compilations and work uh, in the sense of, the, of a commentary, video commentary, and try to get a really comprehensive picture. That's that's what we're dealing with right here uh, with Aquarius, always uh, a comprehensive picture, at least in the later stages of evolution. Sometimes though, you know, the, the sixth ray seems to show up in this sign as little as we might expect it and people become uh, very devoted to their own uh, limited uh, idea of what the ideal group is. You sometimes see some very fanatical people born in Aquarius, uh, but of course, uh, it seems that the sixth ray accompanies them. In this um, banner here that uh, uh, Tuya prepared some time ago, we have the uh, motto, the mantra, water of life am I poured forth for thirsty men. Of course, it's men and women, it's thirsty human beings, you know. Uh, it, it, it's about the great energies of the cosmic etheric uh, plane. Uh, the Buddhic, Atmic, Monadic, and Logoic planes. Of course, the life uh, originates far beyond that, for sure, but uh, we are all thirsty for that which lies outside the area of the dense physical body of our solar logos. Even our causal body, as uh, majestic and important as that is, lies within the dense physical body of our solar logos. But uh, things really start to live, and things become principled, in a cosmic way when we're dealing with the cosmic etheric planes. And I wonder if I've been so fortunate as to, you know, sometimes uh, this is a slightly new computer here, and uh, I don't think that I have what I need. But anyway, you know where the cosmic physical planes are, you know, uh, cosmic etheric planes, you go there all the time, right? 
So let's see if I can. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I can find it now. Um, open. Open usually helps. <clears throat> All right. So these higher four, uh, higher four cosmic planes, um, you know, the, these. And that's where the principled um, energies of the solar logos uh, in his cosmic guise are really found. Aquarius is really a cosmic sign. Uh, it, it connects us with so much that is related uh, to the, the vaster picture. And we, are, we all thirst, you know, we, we thirst for the waters of life. We thirst for that which will refresh us and lift us out of our trance, whereby we take uh, this uh, dense congestion, this dense aggregation of matter to be reality, when in fact it's just uh, attracted to a particular archetype and uh, that I, and it and it forms itself around the archetype and the archetypes are always etheric in some sense the four higher levels of the uh, cosmic physical plane are archetypal in that way and attract the dense uh, uh, physical matter to configure around it but it's not reality we thirst for something more we thirst for true livingness uh, we thirst for that which the monad can give we thirst for the true being which we are and Aquarius can begin to deliver in that regard. Uh, here we have the uh, the Jofra illustration you know they they're, they're very good and uh, they don't deal with all manner of esoterics but they are very esoteric in a way you know uh, under Aquarius and during the Aquarian age the seven centers within our energy system will be greatly stimulated uh, by the Aquarian energies and by the seventh ray energies, which at least in this particular cycle, not in all, but in this particular cycle, accompany the uh, processional age of Aquarius. So we're going to become much more alive in the chakric sense. And as you see, our water carrier uh, is pouring forth the stimulating uh, energies, which uh, you know are not, well, they're not really water in any sense, except that all forms of matter are sometimes called water. So he's stimulating our seven, uh, seven chakras. And if you were to you know, look psychically at any one of us, obviously we're in a state of uh, imbalance and incompleteness. It is the Christ, we are told, who has the perfectly balanced and perfectly complete chakra system. Well, we're going to come a lot closer to that because that whole age will end with um, Venus uh, as the ruler of the last 710 years and that's going to be the era of brotherly love. So a lot of magic will be done in the central decanate, a lot of karma will be expiated in the first decanate and by the time we get to the third decanate we'll have the brotherly love which we all crave and find so difficult to achieve at this time of great uh, conflict. Uh, within humanity due to the changes, many things, due to the changes of energy. Great disturbances are afoot. I was just reading about those today. They're quite amazing and they come from cosmic sources and the human energy system in the planetary logos. The throat center is receiving a lot of that. So things are very turbulent. Um, you know, here, here is, uh, are the jaws of death, so to speak. But if we manage really to walk through the jaws of death, which can be considered in a way the uh, great renunciation of the fourth initiation, we do find the, um, the hierarchical city, you know, the, the, the great city, shining city on the hill. And, uh, but we have to, you know, be brave enough to go through the relinquishment of what we normally are attached to. Interestingly enough, Aquarius is one of those signs that uh, it gives a lot of detachment for better or for worse. Um, you know, uh, to be detached is uh, good, but to be warm of heart and connected while being detached is even better. Um, so this is a sign uh, that's all about our future. Uh, the, some of the rulers are up here. Uh, we have um, Uranus, and we also have the conventional ruler, which is Saturn. 
And there are many Aquarian people who do respond to that Saturn influence. Certainly the first decanate, uh, considered on the, uh, um, how should we say it, the counterclockwise wheel, uh, is Saturn. But remember also that Jupiter is there uh, bringing the group heart out, and finally that's the esoteric ruler, and the hierarchical ruler is the moon. And uh, this is interesting because the moon is simply a veil upon the uh, reception of the energies of Vulcan, physical, Neptune, uh, emotional, and Uranus, again, bringing us occult mind. So it's our lunar vehicles, uh, our elemental uh, vehicles, so often uh, block the true reception of the more refined energies. But on the hierarchical level, that moon slips out of the way and the true energies of Vulcan, Neptune, and Uranus can be received. So let's see if we can do something about that. Um, let's see now, I want to show you, uh, I, I cannot um, go through all of this, but as you know, uh, Francis Donald's illustrations and discussions are available uh, to us, and if you look in the chat box pretty soon, you're going to find uh, uh, how you can access those. Now, this is um, okay. That says the image, but it's not the not the image I want. I hope I can find that. Uh, da da da. Well, I did have it, you know. Uh, Aquarius. Here's the Aquarius text. Full moon image. I'm going to try once more to go back to the place where, let's see if I can find it here. Um, <clears throat> I have a new computer here, and uh, as I explained to my friends at the moment, it's winning. So, <laughs> no, that's not, what, that's not what I want. Anyway, it is a beautiful picture of kind of a Quan Yin type of individual, uh, and it is the great water carrier. Now, let's see if, if any place here we find that. I, I had that definitely in my um, full moon image, full moon image, and I can't understand what happened to it. I feel um, a little bit uh, bad about that. Let's see. Um, I'm going to try one thing if you'll just bear with me, and maybe uh, it will work. These are um, webinar images, and I'm going to try to find that image from 2011 that Francis uh, created because it's so beautiful. Um, Aquarius full moon image and um, mm -hmm, well oh there it is oh fortunately isn't it beautiful. So there is the meditative uh, attitude it looks like a wonderful compassionate female figure it seems to have the Quan Yin quality to it, and it looks to me like it's holding a redeemed uh, Earth. Uh, Aquarius will have a lot to do with bringing the Earth into a state of redemption. Now, when will our Earth really be a sacred planet? Well, that's hard to estimate. Uh, but it may be some millions of years, but we're on our way uh, at the moment. So there is the translucent, uh, becoming transparent Earth. And when the true energies uh, of a higher kind manage to permeate the more opaque uh, energies, then will come the translucence of the earth. Now, I want to hear, maybe uh, Francis has a few words to say about this. Um, let's see, here, uh, he says, depicted here <clears throat> is the uh, ultimate great Aquarian archetype, the ultimate water carrier, bringing, you know, the great energies to us. And Shambhala is going to profit mightily during this uh, next age, and so will we all. Everyone alive today is touched by her hand, for the vessel she carries is now well within the influence of this great sign. When did the sign Aquarius really begin? Well, you might say, you know, when Francis Bacon was born in the late 16th century and died in the early 17th century. He was the prototypical Aquarian. If you look at his astrological chart, it's just filled with the sign Aquarius, sun, rising sign, 
uh, Mercury. So he got the ball rolling, so to speak, for our present humanity. It is a soul awakening influence. Here's a DK being quoted. Uh, the water carrier, another name for the world server, that's what we strive to be, found in every land and in every great city. They work on all the different rays. They express many points of view. And that's so Aquarian, you know, to be universal and to allow all the different perspectives to come in. If you look at the coat of many colors, uh, I think it belonged to Benjamin uh, in, the, in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament. The coat of many colors is a symbol for Aquarius, and so is the rainbow a symbol for Aquarius. So all the qualities are found there. The work uh, on all the differing rays is there. They express many points of view. Their field of service is widely differing. They all carry the pitcher containing the water of life. You know, at first it's on your shoulder and it's difficult to manage. Later there's another stage in which it rises under the law of service, the third law of the soul, right here on top of the head, and there it just streams forth from your head center. So we all look forward to being able to be like that as uh, the masters are. Uh, they carry the pitcher uh, containing the water of life, the higher etheric energies, and they all admit the light in some degree throughout their environment. To you who live and work in this interim period, it's a difficult period for all of us, and in this cycle of transition between Aquarius and Pisces, with all its resultant outer chaos and upheaval, is given the task of expressing steadfastness, service, and sacrifice. All of those can be related to Aquarius, it is a fixed sign, and once an Aquarian makes up their mind, they really hold to it, you know. The service is there. It is the great sign of service. And sacrifice, you know, you know you are the whole, and you give to the whole, and you do not preserve things for your own limited personal self. But <coughs> there are a few other, let's take a look at the, let's see if we have the image again here. Uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, let's see, where have we got here? Better image? Yes, there it is. Okay. Yeah, I just like to look at that and uh, sort of take it in, you know. We're going to have um, 2,000 years of this, and this is um, during the time that uh, the Christ uh, will be spending the last 2,500 years during his uh, Bodhisattva term of service. Usually it's only 2,500 years. He, however, chose in the presence of Sanat Kumara to extend that. And uh, therefore, it is uh, going to be 5,000 year period. Well, here are some of the uh, planets involved here. Uh, Jupiter is involved, and it is the esoteric ruler. Uh, the particular head center that corresponds to the heart center of the cosmic being, here described, radiates the energy of Jupiter. Aquarius is esoteric ruler, which draws into expression the heart of the sun. Now, in our particular solar system, there's one planet that is most like our solar logos. That happens to be Jupiter. Uh, we might say that Venus is most like the, the star Sirius, and each one of our major planets is most like one of the seven uh, solar systems of which ours is one. So our solar system represents the heart center, Jupiter represents in the disciple a great heart center. And so we begin to really get the energies of the heart of the sun when we enter the higher aspects of Aquarius. The sun used to be called, it says here, the eye of Jupiter. Um, so they, they are both, in a way, ray to, uh, well, you can't really call the sun a planet, but it's a ray to entity. It's got a, ultimately ray to monad, I believe, though a fourth ray monad at the present time. It's got a ray to soul and presently a ray to personality. As far as Jupiter is concerned, it's got a ray to soul. So we need those heart of the sun energies very, very strongly because the soul of the planet is coming in and stimulating through the reappearance of the Christ, the soul of humanity. So, you know, we want to begin to live as souls. Uh, something you said here about the heart of the sun, uh, this meditation will result in, says DK, the realization of the true significance of light and the revelation of the meaning of what has been called in esoteric books the heart of the sun, which is the inner point of life in all manifested forms. Now, what is this heart of the sun? You know, from one perspective, it is the uh, soul 
of the solar logos. But there are other places in his uh, vehicles of manifestation where it is represented. For instance, all of our monads are on a plane, on the cosmic physical plane, where on the etheric heart of the solar logos can be found. So that's definitely related to the heart of the sun as well. Illumination of the mind will come with Aquarius and will be seen to be direct and infallible, and that's when the intuition is stimulated. Oh, there's so many good things that are said here, you know, uh, by Francis and by DK. We don't have time for all of them. We just have gratitude to Francis for the, uh, the illustrations and for assembling all this. Aquarius, it will, through the effect of its potent force, now this is interesting, stimulate the astral bodies of men into a new coherency. So as I said, it really is uh, related to the second initiation, which brings the astral body into a state where it can be really responsive to the higher directives. Interestingly enough, you know, Aquarius seems to be related to water, it's really related to air. It has a water-air type of connection. Uh, it will be a, a new coherency in the astral body, very important in group life, into a brotherhood of humanity, which will ignore all racial and national differences. Okay, well, you know, uh, people are trying to do that even now, maybe a little prematurely before the real soul of the nation has emerged, and, and now we have this incredible thing where we're going backwards and we're emphasizing a national egotism. <laughs> and, you know, you think we would have learned our lesson. But anyway, eventually this will all work out and will carry the life of men forward into synthesis and unity. So the Aquarian is able to pervade all that he or she sees and see it all as part of a great unity. This means a tide of unifying life. Think of that, a tide. Those are kind of images having to do with water, but of course they are really a tide of energy. A tide of unifying life of such power that one cannot now vision it, but which in a thousand years, okay, then the, the, the first decanate will be over and will be in the middle of the uh, Mercury decanate, which will be a, a period of magical brilliance and relatedness uh, in a period of a thousand years will have welded all mankind into a perfect brotherhood. Its emotional effect will be to purify the astral bodies of men so that the material world ceases to hold such potent allure. And we do know, you know, the third ray is kind of out of alignment in our local system and is related uh, to cosmic evil in some peculiar manner and we're just too attached to matter but under the age of Aquarius and its abstraction, uh, the desires will no longer hold us uh, with uh, such uh, hold. The material world will no longer hold such fascination to our desire body. It will cease to hold such potent allure and may in the later stages bring about a state of exaggeration as potent in the line of sentient, sentiency as that which we have undergone in the line of materiality. So. I mean, he seems to be pointing towards the emotional possibilities of this age of Aquarius in a future time. But our job is to somehow really respond to the Aquarian energies. Um, you know, increasingly we have to do that. It's a turbulent time. A lot of Piscean things pull us backward. All around us is the backward pull of the Piscean age. Pisces is a wonderful sign, very exalted. It's the sign of the Christ in many ways. It's a great cosmic decanate on the second ray, but we cannot afford to slip back into its lower meanings. Well, let's see, maybe a little bit more. Um, Francis has this, uh, let's see, this is the full moon image of a master and his disciples and all the different tiers. This is T-I-E-R-S, I guess, on the great path, there's a lot of T-E-A-R-S to tears and tears. Uh, but this is the master uh, being faced by the disciples who are in a state of group consciousness. And maybe a few things about the notes there will be of interest. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, okay. Let's see if I can... You know, when you have a new computer, things can be a little bit difficult. I've got all these images of 
but but no text here. Um, 2011, 2012. Let's see, full moon image. I hate to stop, you know, but uh, um, well, I guess I have to. I don't seem to have what I what I want here, but I think we can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll try one other thing, as I often do, you know, see if there's a way under open here uh, that there are uh, Aquarius notes. Yeah, we've got it. Okay. And actually, we've just been oh, kind of looking at it here. But let's see what is said here from the heart of the master. Okay. This is, this is the text. In Aquarius, the man awakens to the beauty of group life, you know, especially, I would say, in the Venus Decanate, to group interest and to his individual responsibility towards the group, thus uh, begins to live his life and to spend himself in the service of humanity. Uh, all of our experience is bought, and we uh, direct our energies and spend our energies for different things according to the nature of our desires, and hopefully they are high enough so that we spend ourselves in the cause of group service, service to humanity. So now Francis kind of describes his image and he says, imagine a group of people sitting around a central figure. Their various facial expressions, physical types, ages, clothing, give us insight into their personalities. Okay, good. But now imagine that we lift our vision from the denser subplanes and visualize the etheric realm. The scene shifts dramatically. The physical vehicles of the group grow dark. For here the light comes from a different source, glowing energetic matrices, vibrant with the color and quality of the group, overlay the dense physical form. And with our inner eye now opened, we see the master sitting at the center of his group of disciples. Those on the outer periphery, and you know, if we approach the ashram, I don't think we should think we're anyplace else but on the outer periphery. Those on the outer periphery are only faintly aware of his presence. But the initiates who sit in the circle immediately around the master know him well, for they have worked for incarnations to attune to his aura. So the master spots you, you know, in early days and maybe looks in every 3,000 years or something, but gradually you are attracted uh, to that master and he may be able to use you if your will is somewhat congruent with his own. Thus, uh, this alignment, known as being close to the master's heart, and that's a, that's a, a the sixth stage of discipleship before that final seventh stage called the blending of the lights. So this alignment enables these initiates to consciously direct the energy of love wisdom that flows through their master from the master of masters, the Christ. Now, uh, so let's just look at that one more time. Um, you know, now hopefully I'll be able to find that, okay. Uh, pa -pa, full moon. Yes, there it is. Okay. So, in the inner worlds, in a sense, as we gather uh, towards the ashram, as we are attracted towards the ashram, this is a symbolic representation of our relationship to the central point. This is, let us say, the master. And he is actually the monadic point within the ashram. So, it's a it's a lifelong process and more than one life, and hopefully we are on our way in doing this. Now, I would just, uh, what I would recommend is, I'm not going to really read any more of that right now. Francis has provided a lot, but it's available to you. Um, let's see now. <laughs> I think in the chat box is the link by now of where you can find his illustrations and the, his uh, analysis and the quotations used by Master DK. So it's very good to have sort of the artistic representation of these states towards which we are all striving. You know, we're all warriors in a way. We are all Hercules. Uh, we are all involved in various labors according to our sun sign and our rising sign. And maybe our rays give a particular slant on how we handle those labors. Uh, the old Herculean dramas, uh, well, that's what they were, you know. They were dramas, educative dramas in the Atlantean period. Because Hercules, though being a powerful first-ray soul, and maybe a first-ray monad was also a great teacher, 
on the second ray. Aspects of him were that. So these illustrations by Francis help uh, give us a different slant on the various labors of Hercules in which we may be engaged, give us a different point of view of that which we have to achieve in each sign of the zodiac. Now, as far as all of us are concerned, uh, we may not have an Aquarian sun sign or moon or rising sign, but we do have to achieve the Aquarian attitude. That is, um, that is extremely important. And I wonder if there's anything there that tells us, you know, sort of uh, what that is. Um, <laughs> well, okay, you know, he talks about the, the serpent vessels. Um, this is um, how we rise uh, according to heart centers in relation to Aquarius to form true group uh, consciousness from the disciples' heart center to the heart center in the head, uh, then to the oic lotus, which until the fourth initiation is the heart center of the monadic life, and then I think the triad takes over. The master at the center of his group, the Christ, the heart center and also head center of hierarchy, um, the life of the monad, which begins to make itself uh, felt at the third initiation and is in Shambhala, and thence the lord of life himself, uh, the heart center of Shambhala, and also, in a way, the head center of Shambhala. So we are moving towards Sanat Kumara, which is, uh, who is the greatest example of the love wisdom ray on our planet. Well, there's, there's lots of mysteries there. Anyway, you'll see more here, uh, and uh, I advise you, if you have time, to ponder on these things. Okay, friends, uh, I've talked for about 30 minutes here, just in terms of uh, preparation. And uh, if all goes well, I will find the... Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm having trouble finding things here. Um, Aquarius vase, banner, aha, full moon image. Um, there it is. I always like it when the meditation shows up. So, now we are ready for our meditative work together, and um, I do, you know, want to welcome all of you. Uh, we're all grateful for your attendance, and um, there's, I guess, almost 50 of us all together, and it's the quality of our work together that finally does count. Um, you know, we have to work subjectively these days. I mean, hardly any of us is in a position to go out there in the uh, political circles um, where there are very big changes. We have to work with the power of subjectivity, and Aquarius is one of those signs dealing with inner energies which allows us to be effective subjectively and hence uh, causing changes in what is manifested from etheric design to uh, physical concretion. Okay, so we begin. <clears throat> and we're in that, um, as I say, we're, we're, how far are we? Just uh, 20, 24 hours, a little more from the actual full moon. So we're really entering here, we're in a day of dedication, and I always like to think that um, 12 hours before the full moon and 12 hours after uh, is the time that Master DK is aware of our uh, selfless meditative approach. It might be the 12 hours before, I'm not exactly sure, but let's just say around the time of the full moon, he said, at least to his group of disciples, uh, in those days that he would be aware of their efforts and that they could, as it were, approach him. And then will come the day of safeguarding, which is the, I like to think of it as the 12 hours before and the 12 hours after the exact full moon, and then follows distribution uh, using all of the vehicles of the personality successively. Uh, we want to make sure that these energies reach other people, but how do we do that? We have to be in the energy ourselves, and it's not like we have to preach to them or tell them something. It's like we have to be uh, a conduit of the energy 
which is available and then it will naturally come out in all of our uh, interactions. So, so we withdraw our consciousness, all of us, we're scattered as persons all over the world, but we withdraw our consciousness from the personality and his vehicles. We pull back. As the observer, we see the etheric physical, the astral, the mental, lower mental vehicle. We are something else. We are actually the, um, well, we're many things, but we are at this phase, the soul in incarnation. We are an extension of soul consciousness <clears throat> immersed within the personal fields towards which we take an objective attitude the old yogi uh, formula, I have a body, but I'm not that body. I have my emotional states, but I am not those emotional states. I have my mind with its many thoughts, but I'm not that. And then we discover uh, that we are the observer. The observer is the soul, but really, even more than that, the observer is the spirit endowed with consciousness. It all depends on the level of our observation. So we withdraw into, as it were, the soul field. And we imagine, at least, that we are all immersed in a field of spiritual light or knowledge, spiritual love, and spiritual sacrificial will. This is our field now. You know, when they say, who are you? We often describe our identity in personal terms, but if we were a little more abstracted and subtle, we would describe our identity in terms of the qualities of the egoic lotus. So we are as if within the unfolding flower of the egoic lotus, the causal body, And this is our true environment, or at least a more real environment than the personal environment. But it may take a while to realize that. And the soul is group conscious, so at least imaginatively we go into a deep sense of the group soul. All of us in the same unitive field. No separation existing, though different functions within the field may exist. So all of us are in the presence of each other. Not so much as personalities, but as souls. Another step up in identity. It would be a very big thing to realize with some consistency that we are the soul.
And realizing that, at least imaginatively, we reach out towards the men and women of goodwill and the members of the new group of world servers, you know, the points of brighter light within the many, many points of dimmer light, as we are told in the reappearance of the Christ meditation that we do um, weekly on Thursdays. We reach out to these points of brighter light. They are soul points within the field. And somehow, if the heart is open, we are connected with these people, although we don't know them personally. We know so few of them personally, but still, we're all in the same soul field. Thousands of us, really tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, all together. But of course, the soul of humanity is one soul. So we do reach out to everybody, really, in the soul state, everybody whether in the body or out of the body. Somehow it's all the great unity of millions and millions, even billions of human units. And through the pervasive energy of Aquarius, we just try to get a sense of this, no matter who you meet, no matter where you are, no matter whom you encounter, it's all in the soul field, really. And, you know, the amazing thing will one day be proved that nobody is a stranger. Ever. Essentially. We know everybody. Not only do we know everybody, we are everybody, but that's another matter. And finally, we, as in Rule 5, in the Raised and Initiations for Disciples and Initiates, we, we realize there is no my soul or thy soul. Ultimately, there's one consciousness with many eyes, you might say. That one consciousness has many apertures of perception. But one day we'll know the yoga where we can look through the eyes of anyone because it's our consciousness. And just confining it to our own humanity, the great secondary mantra, not is but me, begins to make sense. You could dwell on that for the rest of your life. And it would lead deeper and deeper towards identification, not is but me. It takes a lot of time and a lot of silence and inner re perceiving to get to that point where those are not just words, but the reality of spiritual perception.
Now, it's really important when we do this meditation in the Antikorana work, which I've been working on in terms of video commentaries. There's so much there, it's just amazing, you know, to, to realize that we've got to have the personality fed by the soul. The energies of the soul are needed uh, if there's going to be successful projection into the higher worlds via the Antikorana. So, you know, we can all imagine the energies of the 12 petals of the egoic lotus flowing into our point of tension on the mental plane. It's as if each one of us, of course, we have that egoic lotus, but there is the group egoic lotus into the individual, into the group. Those 12 petals send their energies. They may not all be opened yet, but you know what there is sends its energies. and we absorb them. But that's not enough because the jewel in the lotus has to play its part. It's not revealed in our case. We'd have to be initiates of the fourth degree just before the causal body was destroyed to have the jewel in the lotus completely revealed. But we imagine that from the jewel in the lotus, sevenfold jewel, comes the energy of the will into our personality, into our point of tension on the mental plane, the energies we've gathered. There are seven, well, there are many aspects of the will, but DK speaks of the uh, in ray order, the will to initiate, the will to unify, the will to evolve, the will to harmonize, the will to act, the will to cause, and the will to express in ray order. And he says so much about those, or at least some of them, in the latter part of the book, Esoteric Astrology. But we just imagine that in our own case, the jewel in the lotus is supporting this process of projection that we will go through. And those aspects of the wheel are pouring into the individual and into the point of tension that we as a group are gathering on the mental plane. And that the ray of our soul is very much absorbed by us individually, but the great second ray, the indigo ray, is very much absorbed by the group uh, point of tension. So we are imbued with the great second ray of love wisdom, the most important ray on our planet and in the solar system, whatever our rays may be. And then, you know, from the astral body comes the picture-making um, faculty. And one can imagine a sevenfold bridge of light rising from the astral body of everyone through the creative imagination, but of the group. It has all the colors of the rainbow. This bridge of light has all the colors. We kind of, let's imagine it rising through the point of tension on the mental plane that we have gathered. 
and rising across the gap. Now these are, you know, just educational images, heuristic images. They're not occult realities, but okay. We imagine our bridge, the bridge of all, rising to the mental permanent atom. Seven colors it is. And rising to the Buddhic permanent atom as if that atom had somehow configured a Buddhic vehicle, which is not yet fully the case. The coordination is coming after the third degree. And rising to the atomic vehicle as if it existed. That we could work on, you know, that inner subjective feeling of this uh, individual and group bridge rising and finally touching the monad of pure being. Now, for each one of us, two colors of those seven are most important. It would be the color of your soul ray and of your personality ray. In ray order, we can use a red, indigo, green, yellow, orange, light blue or silvery rose for the six ray, violet. Let's imagine that we are selecting the proper colors or indigo if we don't know. And from the mental unit, from that point of tension, we're going to project that, those two colors very vividly upward through the bridge. We're going to project them because there's going to be a multicolored rainbow bridge for the whole group. And we're going to say inwardly, I see the greatest light. I see the greatest light, the secondary word of power, as our two-colored bridge rises, going through the permanent atoms and anchoring in pure being, at least imaginatively, and will outwardly sound the Om. We'll do this three times. Inwardly, I see the greatest light. We say, as we imagine, our consciousness rising into the higher worlds and it evokes a response. We're told over time from the monad itself, from the father's home, from the higher aspects of our being and the two parts of the bridge to meet. So I see the greatest light. We'll use a second ray note, a G. Inwardly, I see the greatest light. Oh. Oh. be difficult enough even to reach the monastic permanent atom and wait for the evo evocative, evoked response, but we imagine that our bridge, our two major colors are touching all those points of the triad and even the monad, and we have a cone-like group Rainbow Bridge, which will make it easier for us to receive 
the testimony of the triad and one day even the spirit itself. And in doing this, of course, we have entered the higher worlds where the masters focus their consciousness. We can imagine that for a moment, their consciousness is habitually there on the higher mental and the buddhic planes and the atmic plane. And we're entering their world. And doing that, we're going to, in their world, salute them, which means expressing our solidarity with them. This is actually something that Master DK had in some of his meditations, so I'm not just making it up. So, it's as if we have entered their world on the Antikorana and are in their presence and cooperating with them and declaring our cooperation. So our first salutation is to the Christ, the master of all masters. Salutations to the Christ, the master of all masters, the teacher alike of angels and of men. We are working with the Christ in his hierarchy and we can begin to feel that that's good. Now, especially the masters M, K, H, and D, K uh, have given out the teaching. They're close to us. So we offer our salutations to that particular triangle. One at a time. Oh. Salutations to the Master Moria, the head of all esoteric schools and organizations. Salutations to the Master Kuthumi, whose ashram is most responsible for preparation for the reappearance of his brother, Lord Maitreya, the present Christ. Salutations to the Master Joao Kuhl, who has given us the blue books and so much of the work of Blavatsky, and who trains aspirants for initiation. Salutations to your own master, as you know him to be or conceive him to be. And 
finally. <coughs> oh. Salutations to the entire spiritual hierarchy of our planet. Now, in this kind of imaginative spiritual intimacy, we raise our thought to Shambhala, the center where the will of God is known. This is not lightly done, as even masters per se cannot enter Shambhala except at certain points, unless they are on the first ray. So it's an august, a mighty center where we can think in its direction. So, um, we lift our consciousness imaginatively with deepest reverence and in all humility and keeping our group identification as a group soul we attempt in whatever way we can to attune to the presence, the radiation, the influence, the energy of the Lord of the world, Sanat Kumara, standing at the center of Shambhala. We do this as a group. And inwardly, we sound a long, silent om, outwardly silent, as we imagine that the group is imbued with some aspect of his energy, the energy of purpose, of will, uh, the energy that stimulates the divine plan. Vast numbers of energies are there, but we'll just call it his energy. The long, inward, silent Om, as we imagine the group thus imbued. Perhaps some aspect, <coughs> excuse me, some aspect of the divine purpose, even of the divine plan, can make an impact upon our individual and group consciousness. We do want to understand the will, we want to strengthen the spiritual will. First, the sacrificial will, then the spiritual will, then the will, ultimately, of the great king of Shambhala. We're far from it, but 
we can begin to be stimulated by some aspect of it, and it will change our incarnated lives entirely. Now we come to that point where we will be entering the indigo sphere. We gather ourselves together at a point, imaginatively. This is a point of tension. It's a point of light. It's a point of love. It's a point of will. And we place ourselves above the golden pathway, which we imagine goes directly into the heart of the indigo sun, where we will imaginatively meet the consciousness of Master D.K. We do want to immerse ourselves in the soul of the planet and the soul of the solar system and closer to home, the great second-ray quality of hierarchy. So that golden pathway shortens and shortens and shortens as it retracts towards the indigo sun and we proceed with it till we are as if absorbed into the indigo sun where we seek to become an outpost as a group at least of the consciousness of Master Decay, which is so astute in regard to the astrological, rheological, hierarchical energies because we want to treat these energies available now as if they are real. Most people don't think anything about it. But these energies are intensified at this period of the Aquarian full moon. We'll be dealing with Uranus, the Orthodox ruler. It's about the uniqueness of every expression of God. So we, under Uranus, will be reinventing the conditioned forms, which <clears throat> so many of which hold us in prison because of the ignorance with which they were created. So we will express our authenticity under Uranus. We'll be visiting imaginatively <clears throat> Jupiter, the esoteric ruler, conveying the power to achieve spiritual growth and fulfillment through loving group cooperation. The individual is fulfilled within the group and the group is fulfilled within its larger context. Jupiter is the carrier of one of those aspects of will called the will to fulfillment. It's connected with the sign Leo and so is Jupiter, interestingly. And we'll be visiting we're thinking about the energies behind the symbol of the moon, the undiscovered planet Vulcan, the highly sacred planet Neptune, second ray monad, and again Uranus, the final hierarchical ruler with its first ray monad, 
So this is all about the transfiguration of the personality and all aspects of it. Vulcan will be rendering the etheric physical body strong and fit and radiant. And Neptune suffusing the emotional body with the buddhic principle of love. That's needed for the transfiguration and Uranus transforming the mind as ordinarily used into occult mind. These changes will occur for all of us eventually as we move towards that change of state in which Aquarius is so often involved and it's called the transfiguration. So let's first take these planets one by one as if the energies of these planets are really present now in an intensified manner available to the group now not just abstractly but really making changes in our individual and group energy system. So first it's Uranus. It's a kind of a turquoise planet outwardly and inwardly with its first ray monad. It's the home of electric fire. So powerfully involved in all demonstrations of electricity, especially the first aspect. So this energy is here for all of us. It's the great alchemist that's in its seventh ray guise, seventh ray soul, first ray monad. We focus on the alchemical power of Uranus to transmute, transform, transfigure, and translate leading to the reordering of the lower worlds according to the pattern in the heavens. The archetypal pattern, Uranus is the heavenly one, we're told. Transform, or transmute, that's physical. Transform, applied to the emotional vehicle. <coughs> Excuse me transfigure to the mental vehicle, translate, taking it all into the cosmic ethers. Maybe there's another verb, maybe transubstantiate, taking it into the uh, nirvanic realm. We're going to change Aquarius is a great sign of change, and I don't know how many incarnations we'll have during the age of Aquarius, but we certainly won't be as we exit from it as we are now. So we open our consciousness to this Uranian stream of energy, sometimes, you know, configured in terms of violet energy. We allow that Uranian stream to enter. It's very electric, it's electric fire. Of course, the question exists whether we can really handle it, but as a group, we can at least conceive it and experience something of its presence, making the spirit real. But of course, that has more to do with the final hierarchical 
meaning of Uranus. At first, we're simply doing things in an original way, an individual way, something that conforms to the pattern of what we are. And so we attempt to realize the areas in which we or our group or groups are most in need of the divine qualities of Uranus. Certainly each one needs to bring his or her original gift pattern to the whole. And in this way, the divine will actually works out. So we're going to sound a note. We'll use the note B. It's a violet note under some circumstances. And we will imagine the flow of Uranian energy, transforming energy, into our individual lives and into our group and groups. Uh, bestowing, endowing with a quality of changing the pattern of things so that pattern becomes more archetypal. Oh. Our pattern can change and more freedom can come. And then we ponder on the esoteric ruler, great Jupiter, planet most like our solar god. It bestows something being really developed now, and increasingly in the Aquarian age, the fullness of group consciousness. Maybe we just know a little bit about it now compared to what we will know, and group love, enlarging and unfolding the group astral body, and of course the causal body rather, well maybe the astral body too, if we think of it as being filled with booty, Jupiter is one of those buddhic planets as well, but the group egoic lotus, causal body, enlarging, fulfilling, building and completing the realization of group soul. We talk about it all the time, group soul. But do we at all really understand it, feel it, function within it? Through Jupiter, Aquarius, Shambhala, becomes uh, or become the conveyor of life more abundant. The Christ look at, looked at us and, you know, evaluated us as poor ones. We have so little compared to what we might be, what we might have, what he and the masters have, but the abundant life is coming. The cornucopia is coming. Fulfillment, enlargement, far beyond our little scope now, 
in power and in consciousness. It's all coming via the group in which we participate rightly. It's on its way. So let's try to feel the flow as we open our consciousness imaginatively to the impressions born upon the Jupiterian stream of energy. It is the energy of abundant life flowing into us, enlarging our horizons and uh, compensating for the state of limitation in which we so often find ourselves. These energies are here. They're available now, they can flow into us, often through the heart center when it comes to Jupiter, but the heart within the head should not be overlooked. And we try to realize the areas in which our ourselves individually and our group and groups, how could they benefit from this Jupiterian energy? Certainly the benevolence would be there. Generosity would be there. Largesse, spiritual largesse would be there. You know, there's no place for pettiness in disciples. No place for withholding what should be given. One can't give everything, you know, but it's not wise, but there's a timing to it. We cannot withhold what could be given, what could advance those, the process of those who receive. Every day we are confronted with the possibility of giving. So we think, you know, how does our group, our groups, ourselves, what do we need here from Jupiter? And we, we see the flow coming in. It's kind of a royal blue, you know. It's one of those colors. It has maybe an admixture of purple. There's a strong seventh ray with Jupiter. And we see it flowing in to our lives. We'll use a second ray note the G again, and we'll see the flow of Jupiter with its presence at this time, its augmented presence, flowing into our lives and the lives of our groups. And truly, we are more together. Together we can be more than what we are individually, and the great fusing energy of Jupiter helps us with this. Now, our next encounter 
It's not so much with the moon, it's with the veiling influence of the moon. Our lunar vehicles, which block out so much of the pure energies. But from hidden Vulcan, from transcendent Neptune, and from, again, electrifying Uranus come the transfiguring powers that change our personality into the true servant of the soul. It's as if these energies are present. We're going to change and be truly transfigured personalities one day. We'll owe it to Vulcan, Neptune, and Uranus. Vulcan, the radiance of the etheric physical atoms. Mars is dull compared to Vulcan, who polishes, burnishes the shield of Mars. Neptune out there, pure blue, such a lovely blue, deep blue planet, second ray monad. Transcendental love in the astral body the buddhic vehicle conveying its love wisdom and the monad and the cosmic astral plane. Neptune has not yet, as far as we're concerned, released its transcendent gifts, which we will only later appreciate. And finally, Uranus, occult brilliance in the mental body. Those three. So let's imagine this uh, triple stream of Vulcanian, Neptunian, Uranian energy. I won't select the different notes, I could, but we'll just, we'll just use the synthetic second ray note as they flow towards our planet, Shambhala hierarchy the individual, the groups, and all together in our personality we are spiritualized by this triple flow, Vulcan, Neptune, Uranus. A triple stream entering our group and groups and affecting us individually transfiguring eventually not only the individual personality, but the group personality and the personality of nations and all of humanity eventually. Every aspect of our personality receives the stimulation it needs and rises to such a condition that the soul really can express through it. See that moon, that uh, veiled moon, that uh, hierarchical moon, it represents the transfiguration of every part of the personality. Vitalization, electrification, power, powerful stimulation with the three aspects of divinity. And this will happen more and more during the Aquarian age, which essentially is ruled by Uranus, not just in an orthodox manner, but in the highest possible manner, being the veiled hierarchical ruler of Aquarius.
So there are the planets whose energy is present. And during these days and on the way to the full moon and afterwards, we have to treat the energies as if they are present. Do you feel Uranus? Do you feel Jupiter? Do you feel Vulcan, Neptune? Do the rays, the planetary rays coming from these great deities touch us? We must act as if they do, and maybe if we act as if in the right way, we will feel the impact and really benefit from this full moon period. All of this we know is within the great body of the blue logos. Just imagine the sun as the vehicle of the solar logos, a great being on the second ray. It's love wisdom. He's the heart center of a great cosmic logos. And it's love pouring through everything, and at the heart of every atom is Buddhi. The sun is a living being, and we as monads, we are that which has its home within the sun. Amazing statement. You can find it in Initiation, Human and Solar. That which finds its home within the sun, that's what we are at this time. Love, wisdom, pervading everything. And whatever our rays may be, in this solar system at least, and in this planet, we are units of love, wisdom. If we could just get that, express that, we would have accomplished so much. Serve and express love in your surroundings and to the extent that you are able to do this, you are blending your little will with the greater will of God. And then the constellation itself, it's, it's a large constellation and it's rather faint in some ways, but there is the Lord of the constellation Aquarius. And it brings forth a kind of light, a peculiar quality of light with a beautiful name, the light that shines on earth across the sea. Maybe it's coming from above, and the sea, the buddhic sea, the astral sea, the, the cosmic astral sea. And the earth can be the entire cosmic physical plane, but you know, closer to home, it's everything in the dense physical body of our planetary logos and our solar logos. This is the light, says the Tibetan, which ever shines within the dark and cleansing with its healing rays that which must be purified until the dark has gone. How beautiful those thoughts, the cleansing, healing aspect of Aquarius. The light shines on earth across the sea. And obviously we have to do a lot to purify our astral bodies if our etheric physical body is to be reached with purifying energy. So let us open ourselves to the feel of the energy quality of Aquarius, as if it's touching us. And we attempt to realize it has a profound relationship to the fifth ray of mind as a constellation. 
all these different rays are coming in via the planetary rulers. When we think of Aquarius, there's, it's universal. There's not a ray that's not there. It's all there. Whether through decanate rulers or the three levels of rulers or veiled planets, all, all the rays are there. Hence the universality. And we can emerge from this period feeling far more inclusive, universal, relate to all kinds of energy demonstration, all kinds of people, see their place. We can do that. And so now maybe the important, most important part, building up uh, to the exact full moon moment, on the, uh, well, tomorrow GMT, really, at 12, no, it's actually the 11th, isn't it? At 12.32.48, building up. As we think of this, and we have some moments of silence, as we do, but you can hold this in your silent meditation during the coming day and following. We'll just give a little start here, and let's see what it means to us. Water of life am I poured forth for thirsty men. You know, we remember the Christ and the Buddha called themselves the light of the world. They could have called themselves the love of the world and eventually the will of the world. It's not that we're identified as a tiny little emanation, tiny, tiny little unit this monad and extension where something bigger. Water of life am I poured forth for thirsty human beings, thirsty men and women. But, you know, the word men is used because it, humanity is manus and uh, at this time a masculine kingdom. Okay, let's ponder. Water of life am I. Water of life am I, poured forth for thirsty men. In the familiar form we see, let us say, in the mirror. In this mantra, it's not what we are. We are pure being from the monadic plane and beyond. 
We are our spiritual will. We are that. We are spiritual love wisdom. We are the light of the world, spiritual light. We are all those expansive things. And through this consolidated instrument we have, our identity as these larger fields can pour forth. If we could but conceive it, thinking of the livingness of the cosmic etheric planes, we are the being of all beings, we are the great will behind all willing, We are the great love behind all loving. We are the great light behind all knowing, all seeing. Can we transfigure our mind in such a way that we can identify in that way. Water of life am I poured forth for thirsty men. But even if we could release the positive energies of our chalice, our egoic lotus, through the higher chakras and so forth, even that would be a great help to the forms of life we contact. Humanity is thirsty for realization, for participation in the wider life and maybe we know a little about it and can help. Water of life. Am I poured forth? for thirsty men. Well, one could ponder for hours there, you know, and maybe some of us will take this into the heart and mind and really work with it and release such energies as we do have to make better the circumstances around us. Maybe we'll do that over the next days, and especially as we move towards the actual moment of the full moon. And of course, distribution is very important, of course. It's a great stream of energy. You know, it comes from the one about whom not may be said, but there are many of those. But we have a local supercosmic logos, 
And through the zodiac, which is the heart and the head center of that great supercosmic logos, Aquarius, the constellation, plays its role. And it flows through other constellations, probably all of them that are chakras in the supercosmic logos. But eventually it reaches our, reaches our own uh, cosmic logos in which our sun is a heart center. These seven solar systems of which ours is one and from the sun through Uranus, Jupiter, Vulcan, Neptune, and again Uranus, all the way from that exalted Pleiadian source down to our relatively humble planets and thence into Shambhala where under the law of assembly at these times the energies are brought together and shared with all monads and into hierarchy with all masters and souls and finally, you know, into the personalities of those who can manage these energies somewhat consciously. So, you know, our the heart and the head center in our own etheric system is going to be stimulated. That radiant chalice, you know, it's very Aquarian with all the colors of the rainbow. We're going to receive that. And be very stimulated in the right way. by these elevated Aquarian energies. We try to make this real to ourselves. So, you know, we're not just like doing a meditation, forgetting about it. We're carrying this forward as if these energies are real. They are as if they're present. Yes, they're intensely present. The world is in great difficulty at the moment because of the change of ages and the ending of great ages, beginning of others. Many factors are operative. And the right energies need to be distributed. So let's just think, you know, Aquarius, the sign of service, of sharing, where would we, as a group, where would we as an individual direct for some healing, some re-archetypalization? Where would we direct these Aquarian energies, these planetary energies associated with them, these ray energies? What could be the result? Let's find an area somewhere on our globe that we think needs special attention. And having located that, let's send imaginatively the Aquarian and associated energies into that area of difficulty. Again, we'll simply use a second ray, Om, as love wisdom is the thing at the moment. And we'll see some transformation of the trouble occurring, some improvement of the situation. Just watch it unfold before your eyes, your inner eye, as the situation becomes more positively Aquarian changing from what it is to a positive demonstration of Aquarius. <clears throat> oh. 
We're going to close this meditation with the sounding of the great invocation, the ancient invocation for power and light, which was released by Sanat Kumara to the Christ and thence to the hierarchy when the Christ agreed to come in a physical form. Maya Virupa presence at great sacrifice to himself, of course, as the more we descend into materiality and density, the greater the confinement and sacrifice. But in any case, this is our very, very powerful instrument for facilitating preparation for the reappearance of the Christ. So, let us together (coughs) sound the great invocation and thinking of the, you know, Aquarius, the sign of distribution, these energies of light and love and power, they are being distributed widely to humanity and making a positive difference. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love, Within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, Let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, Let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth.
Well, friends, uh, I thank you all, and especially those of you who managed to stay the course. It was a long discussion and meditation, hopefully preparing us for the exact moment of the full moon, which occurs early morning, um, GMT on the 11th, 12.32 and 48 seconds, um, Swiss ephemeris, AM. So we hold our point of tension. We hold our individual and group antikarana. We relate to the higher worlds of the cosmic ethers from ruled by Aquarius and from whence will descend these greater energies, hopefully restructuring things in a new and more archetypal way on the outer plane. But of course, we must persist. Now, I suppose that in the chat box, I hope so, is the link for the Aquarius uh, full moon, and uh, I hope so. Uh, and, okay, well, we do need that. Uh, if someone can put that in, if it's already there, just ignore what I'm saying. But you should be able to get that on the Moria Federation uh, website. And tomorrow with music and image uh, and so forth, um, we will include the time of the exact Aquarius full moon, build up your point of tension to then hold it seriously. Hierarchy works for seven days on these things and at least we can work for a little while. So, good night here from the Temple of Silence. It's just about midnight here in Finland. And many blessings to everybody and hope that we'll be if you haven't got other things to do uh, relative to the full moon, hopefully we will be seeing you for the um, exact moment uh, meditation for the Aquarius full moon. Okay, lots of love to everybody, and we'll see you in the mind's eye before long. Okay, bye-bye.